good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I am here today with special guest, Dr. Jeffrey Reidinger, and you are in for a real treat. I know you've heard me say that sometimes before, but today it is just an honor um, to bring this doctor here who's really talked about some cutting edge science around spontaneous healing. And I know if you've listened to me, you understand there's more than just the physical body and that often even through our thoughts, the way we um, emotionally interact with our environment and all the things that have happened to us affect our health and our journey in that process. And we're going to dive deep into that, but also just into the science of how the mind affects the body and how the mind affects the immune system. And many of you know my own story, overcoming breast cancer and Crohn's. So this is a topic that's ex especially um, personal to me because I've been on that side of facing you know, facing my own mortality in the face uh, at 25 years old and not knowing if I was going to survive. And now I'm one of your stories. You could have, I could have been in your book <laughs> as far as how this happens. I've lived it. And so I so related to those things. Mm. Let me just introduce him formally. And then I want to um, let him talk. Dr. Jeffrey Reidinger is a physician and best-selling author, popular speaker. He's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and the medical director of McLean um, Adult Psychiatric and Community Affairs at McLean Hospital. A licensed physician and board-certified psychiatrist, he has also a master's in divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. His research with remarkable individuals who have recovered from incurable illness has been featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show, Dr. Oz Shows, among others. He's been nominated for the National Broadwell Leadership Award and has received numerous awards related to leadership and patient care. His best-selling book, Cured, Strengthen Your Immune System and Heal Your Life, is available at Amazon, local bookstores, and multiple languages. And I want to be sure if you're listening here, you will have the links to get that book, um, because I just think it is one of those things you will not want to miss um, uh, reading it. I just finished myself. So Dr. Reidinger, what I always love to store, uh, start with this story. Because as you know, story is so profound, not only in our own healing journey, but even like how we get into doing what we're doing. So tell us a little bit about you, your background. How did you get into this journey to where you're writing a book about spontaneous feel, uh, healing, especially with um, regards to the fact that you're a very conventionally science grounded, you know, well-respected physician. And this is kind of bridging those two worlds. Mm. Yes. Well, this has been a very personal journey as well as a professional journey for me. Um, Similar to you, I grew up in the Midwest on a farm um, in a very conservative tradition. My father came out of the Amish tradition. My grandfather was a blacksmith in the Amish. And, and we left the um, Amish community outwardly when I was two, but my parents didn't so much leave inwardly. So we moved to a small farm about 35 miles away and we had tractors and a car mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things. But there was a lot of suspicion and rules against listening to the radio. I was supposed to be on the bus, but tune the radio out on the school bus. <laughs> you know, and not many people know this, but I didn't have a TV growing up either. It was in the closet. And it was like this big secret. So even television, I so understand that because even though it wasn't the exact same tradition. Yes, the right. Exact thing where it's like, you don't li listen to a lot of the media. And <laughs> so I totally- That's right. Can't. Yes. <laughs> yes. It took me years actually yeah. before I could start letting myself psychologically hear the words of right. this sinful rock music <laughs> <laughs> so, so but yeah a lot of restrictions and fears around tv around science as being evolution and the tool of the devil and so the long and short of it i was growing up in a very different culture at home than i was experiencing at school uh, there's a lot of good things about growing up in such a conservative farm my parents grew some of their own wheat so we had a whole wheat bread we had uh, a lot of uh, very healthy foods, but um, it was also a very emotionally constricted and physically and emotionally violent home. And so I think that also fed a lot of my questions. And my life has been an effort to study the things I needed to learn in some ways. I was trying to figure out what's true. Yeah. Um, when you're when the worldviews at school and at home are completely incompatible, <laughs> yeah. it's challenging. And so I began at a really young age trying to figure out how do you know what's true. Yeah. I was pretty rebellious as a kid, um, mostly because I just wanted freedom to think for myself mm -hmm. um, and went to college. And then in college, I had these wonderful professors who helped me begin thinking about um, what are the interdisciplinary underpinnings for how you understand what's true? 
these different disciplines all are next to each other and they are trying to answer similar questions from a different vantage point. Yeah. So then I went to seminary at Princeton. That was a continuing journey to figure out how do we know what's true? Um, and then um, began to uh, study the relationship between science and faith and theology and spirituality and, and became convinced that science is a great tool of truth. It's a partial and limited tool of truth, but very important. Yes. So then went to medical school. Um, I, I came home one weekend to Indiana and my best friend's mom from high school asked what I was going to do with all my education. And I was at seminary at the time studying a lot of great ideas. And I said, well, I'm going to be a professor. And she said, you're going to get all that education and not do something to help people. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, love so it. I, I was still living in two different yeah. world. Groups. Right. And, yeah. and so education was suspect. So when I then decided to go to medical school, that's something that people from the world I came from understood much more easily. It was a world that they valued and made more sense. So going to med school was a perfect solution for me, it gave me something practical, practical to do that um, the world I came from understood, but also left me free to study ideas and yeah. theology and spirituality and psychiatry and all that. So that's what I did. And then right after I finished residency at Harvard, um, back in 2000 and Two, an oncology nurse from Mass General in Boston came to me and asked for help explaining to her son that she'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. That's a devastating diagnosis, as you know. Uh, usually people die shortly after diagnosis with a brutal, painful, really difficult death. And um, so I, I helped her explain that to her son. And then she took off for a healing center. She began to write and call me saying that uh, she was seeing some amazing recoveries and um, she was hoping I would look into it. I declined, thinking that yeah. nothing likely was going on that couldn't be explained through right. normal medical science. But uh, I owe a lot to Nicola because she was very persistent and uh, she began telling people to send their stories to me, to send me their medical files. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I continued to decline for a while, but I did, I did begin to look at the reports. And although most of them I could explain through being a, a great chemotherapy responder or something like that, the upshot was that there were some of the stories and medical files I had no explanation for. Yeah. And so in 2003, I began to study this formally. And the last 19 years has been a journey of incredible professional and personal transformation and um, talk about turning worldviews upside down. Uh, it's turned upside down many of the assumptions I had learned in med school, in, uh, even in seminary, uh, in my residency in psychiatry. And so it's been a journey that has meant the world to me because it's improved my own understanding of what illness is, what healing requires, um, what our lives are about, what my life is about. And so uh, it's, I've been a slow learner, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity. <laughs> that is amazing. And I hear in your story, there's some things that are really profound. And I, I could tell from the book, number one, I love that you're a truth seeker. And I feel the same like drive in my own heart, because it's almost like um, if we really, truly desire truth and to find it, then we can take things from all different backgrounds, philosophies, religions, and even science backgrounds and pull them together. And what I loved, you said something else that I've always found. I'm like, I have a very strong spiritual belief and faith, but I also have a very strong science background. And I never feel yes. like one is more important than the other. Like, yes. it's like, like we talked right before we got on, I'm a medical doctor. And I feel like in the allopathic world, I'm still well-respected because I use great science and how I treat physical yeah. patients, but I'm open-minded enough to say, you know what, I don't know how, how, why this happened or how this works, which is what your journey has been, but I'm willing to look at it and, and maybe ask the questions, what else is possible? Like with your healing as, as my patient or with, and those things, honestly, I see among our colleagues are kind of rare. There's not, that's why I saw, I saw your book and heard you and I'm like, this is a man after my own heart because <laughs> I know that seeking for truth and even the combination of, and faith can be whatever background. We're not saying it has to be how you or I believe, but it's like whatever yes. place you come from, 
that idea that there's more to life than just like that meaning, that purpose, that depth, which we'll talk about, and the science. And you don't have to take one or the other. You can actually have both and have yeah. a deeper, more meaningful understanding of life, right? Yeah, that's so well said. I think that's fundamentally true. There's things that science can study because science is about the evidence of the five senses. It's about the things we can see and touch. And that's really important for understanding our world. It's the gift of Western culture to the rest of the world. But there's also more than our hearts can tell. And those are things that are harder to prove. You know, we can't prove the existence of love. We can't prove the existence of um what it means to have a really quality relationship. Not all of those things can be captured by science, right. but yet they're really important. And so being able to use both our left brains and our right yes. brain is harder, but really important and very meaningful. So true. And it sounds like you started the journey kind of like me. I was a bioengineer. I was all analytical. I was completely oh. left brain, very masculine driven, you know, all that. My family was all engineers, farmers, wow. definitely like high level. And then what happened is what mm. I learned, I've been practiced a little over 20 years. And what I learned is the most important um, ahas and healing and things that I've seen are actually trusting that intuitive side and that thing that doesn't always make sense. And I always say it's almost like this old um, analog computer, the analytical mind can do this process of data calculation and can do maybe thousands of data points. But when we go to a heart centered intuitive place and like take both, I feel yeah. like take millions of pieces of data in an instantaneous second, our subconscious can come up with answers that aren't possible through just purely analytical that kind yes. right? Yes, I think that's absolutely true and so well said. There's these different ways of knowing yes. and science is important, but it's not the only path to knowing truth and, and right intuition and what we know at a deeper level in our hearts or in our guts is pivotal and critical. So you've got so many stories in your book and you clearly, you know, encountered some amazing and now you probably have a mailbox full of people wanting to yes. share, right? Um, but tell us just uh, maybe one or two or a few of the things that maybe were changes because I want to talk about maybe a story and then like what are some of the foundations that you saw um, in healing that were common? And, and I love that you said it wasn't always diet. It wasn't always like, in fact, many times it wasn't. There was this deeper. So let's talk a little about first, just maybe a story or two that kind of got you thinking in a different direction of one of your patients. Yeah. Clients. Yeah. I mean, I, there's so many stories, so it's hard to know where to begin because every story is kind of a universe unto itself. Yeah. True. And, and it's so, there's no way to capture that magnificent nuanced universe in one short story in the book. True. And so yeah. I did the best I could to capture as much as I could to capture the essence, but these stories are amazing. So I start off cured with talking about Claire, yeah. who was diagnosed in 2008 with pancreatic cancer, um, actually the worst kind of pancreatic cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, diagnosed by biopsy. So we know she had it, we know that was the right diagnosis. And I wrote, I started off with her story because there's something about the way she tells it that's universally human. It's, it's, it's both very specific to her, but also touches on so many universally human yeah. uh, parts of our journeys. So she the was one about to retire, like just looking forward to her. I think that yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, a person she believed in science, mm -hmm. but she decided after investigating uh, what the Whipple surgery is, uh, which was going to remove a lot of her abdomen and leave her with side effects the rest of her life and probably still not yeah. um, leave her with a clear path to recovery, uh, but with chronic pain, most likely. Mm -hmm. She decided that in spite of her deep belief in science, that, that she didn't want to pursue the surgery because she didn't want to live with that kind of pain and complications. Um, so whom you have a grudge, for example, and she'd struggled with some uh, issues with her mother, for example. And that was 2008. Um, time began to go by. She'd been told that she had a year to live or so. Um, and next thing you know, it is 2013. Um, she's been making a lot of changes in her life, not immediately, but progressively and steadily. Um, and she had a, an abdominal CT in 2013 for unrelated reasons, and the cancer was gone. And, and so that was a shock. And so then she began to backtrack and figure out how had this happened. 
One of the reasons I start off with her story also is that she has a website. And so people can go into more detail than I had room in the book. Uh, it's livingwithpancreaticcancer.com. And, and Claire just writes very humbly and humanely about her journey, uh, about mistakes she made, about things she learned. And, um, and, and she and I, she's one of the people that taught me that not one diet fits all, that it's not about a particular dietary approach. It's not about um, a particular type of meditation. It's, it's really about finding the, the steps towards healing and well-being that work for each one of us. And there's a lot of variation around that, but there's some common, very common threads and pillars. So, so that's what she did. And, and uh, so um, she faced death. Uh, she, she was one of the people who taught me among many others that it's facing death can often become its own release, its own doorway into a different life because if we die to a less authentic version of who we are and become more authentic in our lives and our relationships, that death then renders a person with a different kind of life, a different kind of boundaries and relationships, um, and even changing relationships, uh, yeah. letting some relationships go, letting toxic relationships go, letting more emotionally nutritious relationships come into one's life. So it's, a, it's just a fascinating journey. I was very touched by her story. I love that. And I think like I deal a lot with environmental toxicity and uh, whether it's mm. heavy metals or mold or other or infections or things in those complex chronic cases that end up being chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or cancer. But yes. what I found is kind of what you're talking about here is that transformation. So I was, I'm writing a book right now too, but the bottom line was, it was going to be kind of about environmental toxicity and toxic load and these things. But what I found mm. is the biggest, deepest healing, even in these patients who maybe don't have cancer is the toxicity of relationships, personal trauma, the identity, all these deeper issues of like, those yeah. things are so powerful to shift the needle, even more so than living in a clean house, breathing clean air, drinking clean water and eating clean food. And I really yes. like that you said that because there's a lot of books out there about cancer that say this one diet does it. And you and I know that's not true. Maybe for a few people it worked, but the truth that's is right. it's not a one size fits all. And I really love that you talked about that because a lot of people still think, oh, maybe if I would have eaten perfectly or done all the right things. And I, it sounds like to me with where your book has gone, it's really um, the level above that are how we think our relationships. And like you said, when we face death, I know that because I've been through that at 25 facing cancer, it really did almost shed a level of caring about it. All of a sudden I could just be like, you know what? I've already faced death in one. I always joke, it's like, I have nine lives. So what's what the heck, why not risk it a little bit more? And so, so often we're afraid to risk and it can be afraid to risk even in showing up as our true selves. Tell yes. me more about that because it feels like that's such a root that was really underlying most of the healings is something about finding the true self, living authentically, or we can also go into the um, default mode network, one of my favorite, but talk a little yes, bit about right. this deeper piece of identity and what is that uh, relationships, how does that play into this healing that you've seen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly true that the, uh, of the four pillars, you know, whether it's healing one's nutrition, healing uh, one's relationship with stress, healing one's immune system, those are certainly important, but mm -hmm. the, the pillar that over, over and over was the point in the conversation and in the interviews where people would sit up, they would get a light in their eyes, and they, they would say, this is why I'm so grateful for the illness, because this is the thing that changed my life. I became convinced that some people could eat cat food and still get better. I mean, because they made such deep changes in yeah. their understanding of their value and, um, and and the elimination of false beliefs. So it, it's, and it's shocking how deep this goes. One can walk around this, uh, trying to get a sense for the size of this. It's shocking, for example, how often when a person is diagnosed with cancer, they will be, of course, terrified at one level, but sometimes at another level, more often than you would think, there's this kind of relief, like, uh, well, I guess uh, if, if I only have six months to live, I don't have to take over the family business, like yeah. the pressure is putting me on uh, from parents, or I don't need to go to law school just because everyone's expecting me to, or I don't need to do this, or maybe I don't need to be taking care of everyone else in my life because now I have a reason to focus on my own needs and I have 
in their minds, a legitimate excuse for mm -hmm. beginning to finally focus on what they need for their own well-being. And that, that decision to begin um, letting go of a false self that's taking care of everyone else instead of also paying attention to our own authentic needs and our own right to have a life that has well-being to it, that shift is um, what I believe is about the healing of identity and waking up to the value, the magnificence, the goodness of what we each bring into the world and beginning to focus on that and to heal our traumas, to heal the, the critic in the back of our minds that's telling us we're not good enough or right. that we don't have value or there's something wrong with us or something defective with us. And those false beliefs cripple us more than I think we easily see mm. and limit us. Yes. So well said, because if I hadn't put in a nutshell, some of this like real amazing healing, not only in my own self, but in my patients, it's really been with, I grew up in a culture, maybe similar to you, maybe not where to love yourself was like false. Like you, you're supposed to be humble. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to love others more than yourself, you know, love your neighbor. Right. So there's this real like emphasis on giving of yourself, sacrificing yourself, martyrdom, which is all beautiful. Like it creates wonderful, loving, beautiful people. But if those same people, including myself, don't first love and value their own selves as a, you know, a unique individual that has a voice and has a reason for being and has a purpose and meaning, like you said, then what happens is you at the, at the core, there's this almost self-loathing and I'm yeah. sure you can, like, especially with autoimmunity, there's a metaphorical connection between self-love mm -hmm. and loathing. And it makes sense. It's a body attacking self, right? Like the physical body is just yes. mimicking the mindset of that attack. And when I realized that and had to really shift and it started with not only that trusting that I knew what might be best in a situation versus relying on everybody else to tell me what I should be or should do, or, you know, and then also actually yeah loving myself like realizing that I was valuable and those seem so simple and for those of you listening that maybe already have found that it's it's maybe not that big a deal but for those who haven't it's those shifts are profound because you can start living then from an authentic place saying no setting boundaries um and it sounds like you've seen a pattern probably more with cancer I know for sure breast cancer I think Gabor Mate talked about those over nurturing, over caring yes. individuals. Is that a common theme with cancer of the, like taking care of everybody else and neglecting your own soul and self? Yes. Yeah. And it's a huge theme. And now that my eyes are starting to open to see illness in these yeah. ways more deeply and to ask questions about what is underneath the illness and perhaps contributing to it, it's, it's really helped me begin seeing illness and recovery in a completely, through a completely different set of eyes. And, and I think, you know, I mean, cancer is an autoimmune illness, right? Yes. All the major killers are autoimmune illnesses, heart True. disease, <laughs> diabetes, lung disease, autoimmune illness, um, cancer. These are, these are by and large autoimmune illnesses, which basically means that the, the, auto, the, the brilliant cells of the immune system, all these specialized battalions have turned against the body it's sworn to protect and begun to attack the body. And that's, that's part of what chronic inflammation in our bodies is, whether it comes from poor nutrition or from toxins in the environment or from the constant release of stress hormones like cortisol or norepinephrine or adrenaline. The chronic inflammation is the immune system gone awry that, that leaves us so much more susceptible to mm -hmm. cancers and automobiles. And, and I, I believe that our beliefs. Um, if we have mixed beliefs, both true and false beliefs, conscious and unconsciously, um, about our value, about our bodies, then, you know, that's, that's what the immune system is reflecting in some ways, I believe. And, and, and certainly it's, that's a complicated, multifaceted discussion, but our deep beliefs about ourselves, the beliefs that are true, the beliefs that are false. If we have mixed beliefs, some true and some false, we will have mixed beliefs. We will have mixed results in our lives, mm -hmm. in our minds, in our bodies, I believe. Well, I love that you say that because I think that's another core is that the subconscious stuff that we're maybe not even aware of, if we have these parts that are kind of fighting, like unbeknownst yeah. to us, we're like, I believe this and I believe, I believe I'm worthy, but I'm not worthy. Or I believe, you know, I love myself, but I really kind of hate myself and hate my body. Or those things are probably warring on the inside. 
I remember understanding I had uh, breast cancer at 25, got over that, and then Crohn's disease a year later, and again, autoimmune in nature. And I remember like, I'm, right. fighting, I'm fighting now, this will make sense to you. I grew up on the farm with all three brothers, a sister too, but like lots of male, lots of like, you know, pull up yourself by the boost tracks, work hard, you know, don't be right. lazy, um, be strong, don't complain, don't cry. Like all those things were part of the culture. And it made me a very strong, resilient person. So I'm grateful on one hand, but what yes. didn't happen was I happen to be, a, now I know this, but I didn't know back then I'm really sensitive and very highly intuitive. And I kind of suppressed that part of myself. So I yes. strong and tough and everything. So I was this fighter, right? And I came to cancer and Crohn's and I did the mental thing. I always knew like the will of the mind, like Victor Frankl's work on the, the mind yes. is so powerful, right? And I knew right. in my heart, like I can beat this. I can overcome it. I was so confident and I did. But that whole fighting kept me sick until I got mold related illness, got really sick with um, cytokine inflammation and innate immune dysfunction. And I realized about uh -huh. 10 years after the cancer, that fighting analogy and that fighting mentality that I'd grown up with was actually killing me because what it was doing, it was revving up my immune system. All my cytokines were off the charts. And I was like, wait, I have to change this message to yes. my immune system. And I literally started that day meditating on my blood cells and meditating at them being peaceful. I remember just thinking of the little minions, those little yellow guys in the movie um, you know, about the minions. And they were just like these peaceful warriors, but they were whistling. They were you know, escorting the toxins out of my body. There was no fight. And that's the day, Dr. Reidinger, that I feel like my health really started to shift. And there's been a lot more than that. But I love that you say that because these messages subconsciously, yes, it helped me survive cancer and Crohn's, but had I kept going with that mental message of fighting, yes, uh, I would probably not be here today. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's such an important point, I think. And I've really learned that, I mean, many of the women who talk to me about their recoveries, they spoke about consciously shifting away from the militant b battle language towards a uh, language that was more about loving the body, loving the immune cells, um, a much more compassionate and inclusive way of understanding. And, and I think some, some kinds of language work better for different people. I wonder if there's some gender specificity here. Yeah. I mean, we all have both masculine and feminine right. aspects to us and different kinds of sensitivities. Um, you know, I remember Jerry, this battle axe of a Texan, you know, he was the Jim Bowie in the Alamo reenactment yeah. every year, the Texan, he talked about beating two kinds of cancers and he used the battle imagery yeah. a lot to emit image, to create images of him going after the cancer cells in his body and that worked for him. Yeah. Um, but so many people, including Claire, um, yeah. felt they needed to have a more loving and inclusive energy. So I think I love that you say both is needed though, because at 25, I think I needed that fight mentality and I overcame yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. Like there's this place for it. But then like for me, it ran mm -hmm. away and got way too <laughs> then my immune system went way overactive. So it was like having to and I love yeah. about the specific immune system because I feel like it's so neuroendocrine immune allergy, right? We have this new science that actually yes. brings it all together. So the great thing is the stuff we're talking about now is getting more and more research. So it's it's very grounded. But tell us just a little bit about what does that mean? Because it really is this connection of mind and immune and endocrine and how they all work together. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. And it must be so great for your patients and your listeners that you know the science around being able to test for cytokines and things like that. And it's just at a really exciting time that our different worlds of what's going on in the lab and the ability to detect these, the ways in which our immune system is impacted by stress or Mm -hmm. or different kinds of toxins. It's it's a really exciting time. These things are now just starting to be able to be measured and tested and, and captured in real time in people's bodies. But yeah, it's a big it's a big subject, you know. I mean, what we do know is on the basis of both laboratory data and um, clinical experience, we know that there's a huge difference between a body that is being bathed day in and day out with stress hormones like um, norepinephrine, adrenaline, or cortisol, and what that does to the beautiful immune cells of our body. Um, they become sluggish, they begin to fire incorrectly, they begin to attack the body instead of the pathogen, for example. And we know that a body that is in more parasympathetic mode, where the mind is more relaxed, where a person can experience 
more uninhibited, loving, compassionate feelings for both ourselves and others, that that's a very different neurochemistry. Uh, dopamine is about uh, pleasure pathway and purpose, and oxytocin is the love molecule, and present molecule is serotonin, et cetera. So those are two really different sets of neurochemistries, and the body just reacts really differently. And in the parasympathetic mode, it's the the immune cells wake up, they function correctly, they hit their proper target instead of the body. And it's a very different physiology and that's what allows the body to heal. So uh, do you think now, as I'm thinking, just listening to you, I mean, what happened the last couple of years, the pandemic loneliness is at an all time high with isolation. Now yeah. we're starting to get back to normal, but I feel like what I've seen, at least in my clinical practice is the stress levels, the stressors in life, the, I've been at an all time high, right? Um, do you think we're going to yeah. see, I mean, I feel like we're going to see more and more illness because of this. And unless we have the tools to kind of deal with it, but what's your thoughts on that? Because I feel like the stress levels are really escalating probably more yeah. quickly than they were in decades past. Yeah, I think they are. And I think we're pressing towards the need to change the way we live. Mm -hmm. I wish, and I've tried unsuccessfully to get a more national discussion going about these kinds of things that you and I believe and talk about. Um, it's, I think it's ridiculous that we put the whole burden of dealing with COVID on just the three strategies. If, our, if the only things in our toolbox are um, masking, quarantining, and um, vaccinations and a few things like that, I mean, those are important and those are valuable, but that puts a lot of burden on on when we have a lot of other strategies like healing our immune systems, healing yes. our um, healing. I mean, we, we have a culture where we weaken immune systems regularly. I mean, in the way, and even in the way as doctors, you and I were taught to yeah. treat patients, yeah. you know, we give yeah. antipyretics to bring down the fever that's fighting the right. infection. And we give uh, anti-inflammatories um, too easily. I mean, sometimes we give immune suppressants when we're battling cancer. And, and so there's so many ways in which we could fire up the immune system. Back in the days of Pasteur and uh, when Louis Pasteur, you know, he's the father of the germ theory, did this great thing. And uh, it was a really important step forward, but it was a, a partial step because he and a few others like Claude Bernard argued for their entire professional lives. Is it the bacteria that causes illness? Is it the pathogen, the bacteria, the virus that causes illness? Or is it more the, the uh, that we are surrounded by millions of bacteria and pathogens inside and outside of our bodies all the time. And it's just when something in the body breaks down that the pathogen can invade. And Claude Bernard stood up in front of his class. He drank a glass of cholera, which was a terrible plague uh, in that time. And he said, I know how to take care of my immune system. I know how to take care of my terrain, what we now call our microbiome. And so I'm not going to get sick. And he didn't. And so, and so we have well-documented evidence that Pasteur, who said it's all the pathogen, right. it's, 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 not, it's not how you take care of your body. Um, on his deathbed, he admitted that, um, that Claude Bernard and his colleagues were right and that the terrain is everything, mm -hmm. but that's not what we did. We took the easy answer um, and said it's all about taking an antibiotic or taking an antiviral. Those are important, but they're just... Yeah half the story. And, and so we also need to create healthy bodies that can fight off pathogens. And we don't do that in this country. I love that you're talking about this. Cause like you said, we, there was great measures. My thought during, especially in the yeah. early days when we didn't know what was going on, all there was a lot of, we were yeah. a lot of fear, right? And we know fear yeah. is so harmful. And the second thing yeah. so fear, there's so much evidence that fear versus love. Um, and if you think about loving your immune system versus just like the evidence, the, um, man you just mentioned who took the cholera he had no fear he was all about loving his immune system in a way you could almost simplify it that way right. in the early days of the pandemic we were pandering fear and the other piece was the isolation yes. you no know, if you look at loneliness and mortality yeah. I think that's a bigger risk factor than smoking and alcohol and like all the things that we think of as high risk yes. loneliness mm -hmm. is epidemic and we were actually especially elderly in some of those again we did the best we could. I'm not trying to comment on the right or wrongness and, and the measures yes. that we should do. I don't Absolutely. think it's wrong, but, but there's more, right? And just mm -hmm. when I knowing that I was looking there's at- There's more. Wait a second. And I remember like talking about vitamin C and writing about vitamin C and, and getting like curtailed. And I was like, wait a second, like yes. vitamin C, what kind of risk are we taking? Like the, it's just unbelievable that we weren't talking more about what we could really do. And that's a minor thing for the immune system, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
other things that we yeah, do. But yeah, but still, yes, but these, these factors are important. Antioxidants do play a really important role. And, yeah. and so- yeah, Vitamin we, D and we, some basics on, yeah. It, yes, exactly. So yeah, I, I appreciate that you can also walk these two worlds and see what's true and what's distorted yeah. in both. And that's so Absolutely. important. Absolutely. You, that's, you don't have to throw, and you don't have to get all, yeah, for me, there's no, I don't, I can see all sides. I understand. And yet like there's more, yeah. can we bring there's more, more. To people? So I, I yeah. hope you and I can bring that discussion for sure. <laughs> um, so let's talk, you mentioned the pillars, but just so people listening are clear, and I want you to go all you listeners, if you haven't got enough to buy this book, I really want to say that again, and we'll leave, we'll have links cured is the name of the book. It's so worth your read. Um, you'll have lots more stories than just here today, but go ahead and mention the four pillars again. And then I yeah. want to briefly talk about those, but especially the last one. Yeah. So the four pillars are about healing our nutrition. And that's a big topic because I, there's so much misinformation about nutrition. I can remember where I was sitting and what the basically short paragraph of um, nutrition education we received in medical yes. school. And it was, it was IV TPN for surgery, right? <laughs> like yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> completely upside down. In my yeah. case, it was completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the, the, uh, the trifecta of industry who pays the academics for certain results with uh, nutrition research and how that interacts with the lobbyists and the food recommendations that are published by the government is complicated and science is important, but it's also a bit of spin science or business science. And so we need to just be aware there's a lot of distortion and misunderstanding there. And, and, and doctors and nurses and nutritionists have been given a lot of misinformation. And so studying these people who who got better and had medical evidence for recovery from incurable illnesses was a really helpful um, window for me into a truer understanding of nutrition. And so it helped me begin understanding the importance of eliminating most sugar, uh, which yeah. is the favorite food of cancer and the fate and highly inflammatory for the body. I completely, I just want to say with my breast cancer, that was a big turning point. So that wasn't the yeah. only thing, but I totally agree with you. And we know, I think it's in my studies with sugar and cocaine, they chose sugar every time it's more addictive to our brains with the dopamine. It is. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, over a hundred years ago, the average uh, person in the United States ate five pounds of sugar a year, not a big deal. But now the average person eats 154 pounds of sugar a year. Our bodies just are not made to take in that level of a load. And it tends to be in so many things. I was at Whole Foods recently. It was in the salmon that I almost bought. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. In, oh, it's in soups, it's in tomato sauces, it's right. in it's in so many things. And so, and it's highly inflammatory. And you know, as doctors, we're taught to basically attach a radio labeled um, um, marker to glucose inject in a person's body. And if there's a place in the body that's actively taking up, sucking up that glucose, sucking up that sugar, there's a strong likelihood that's cancer because that's cancer's favorite food. So the fact that we don't translate that into helping our patients change what they eat or we dismiss dietary or nutritional changes mm -hmm. is ridiculous. And I can yeah. tell you story after story about people who changed their diet significantly and eliminated a lot of sugar and the effect it had on their uh, health and uh, contributed to the um, mm -hmm. disappearance of the cancer, for example. So the first pillar is nutrition. Uh, it's important, but uh, like I said, the healing of uh, identity and beliefs can be even more powerful, I think. The second pillar is the healing of our immune systems. Um, that's a big deal in a world where we tend to uh, be taught to do things that weaken the immune system and certainly don't buff up the immune system and make it the powerful workhorse that it uh, can be. Um, and then healing our stress response is the third pillar. And that's that's a, a big deal. And I'm I'm always a little bit um, um, against the idea of just simply eliminating stress because sometimes stress does need to be eliminated, uh, but we also can't eliminate all the stresses in our lives. And sometimes we don't really want to um, eliminate, I mean, raising children can be stressful. Yeah. Um, care of aging parents can be stressful. Um, Having a job where you have to drive in rush hour can be stressful. And I think we all have to decide what's the toxic stress in our life? What's the challenge stress that allows us to reach into our higher self and be, become a, a larger being able to manage more stress? 
um, I'm a runner. Running is really good for me. Um, yeah. And, you know, running a marathon can be challenge stress or toxic stress, yeah. depending on who you are and how you, ex how you take that in and process that. So I think challenge stress helps us reach into our higher self and become Absolutely. able to Perform manage better. more yeah. stress. Yeah. yeah, I love that you yeah. say that because if people think like, oh my gosh, I have stress in my life, I'm going to die or this like fearful mindset, it really right. is like a relationship with stress, isn't it? Because if we can just have a calm, like for me, it's like a knowing that things are going to be okay, I, that I will have the yes. resources that I need. So I can have really stressful events, but there's a deep inner well that's like, I know I'll have what I need when the time comes, even if I don't yes. at this moment. And that really relieves that like risk because it's really like how we perceive stress that allows the chemicals like cortisol to go up, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, if we relate to that stress with fear, you're mm -hmm. right. It has, creates a whole neurochemistry of fear and stress. And if we can relate to it in a way that we don't feel like we have to be in control, we can relax, we can feel compassion for ourselves and those around us. And if we can experience it as challenge stress instead of toxic stress, that's a whole different neurochemistry. Yeah. I think there are times when we have to have, we have to help people leave toxic stresses, for leave sure. toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if a person comes home or goes to work every day and they're just taught in direct or indirect ways that they don't matter or there's yeah. something wrong or not good enough about who they are, um, that can be a form of toxic stress where a person just simply has to leave and set up boundaries against that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, th I think the relationship, understanding the difference between challenge stress and toxic stress is yeah. really important. And I love that you mentioned toxic relationships because I could not agree more. My own healing and healing of so many patients really finding, and often, like you said, when you come to a life-threatening diagnosis, you realize, okay, is this really good for me, this relationship? And sometimes you make it better and you heal the trauma. And sometimes you say, no, I'm walking away. And those are both good responses because, but often it takes a pretty life changing event, or at least some awareness to be like, okay, this is not good for me. And again, this is beyond yeah. our topic of conversation, but often we have patterns from childhood or other times in our life, or other people that condition us to feel like that's normal and maybe yes. it's really, really toxic, but we just, our physiology is used to it. So we think yes. it's normal and healthy, right? Yeah. That's a really important point, I believe, because a fish doesn't know what wet is, if it doesn't know anything else. And, you know, I think back to how many of the stories I see of people whose stories are invisible in our culture, you know, and that's particularly relevant in um, with some of the areas of real social injustice, um, mm -hmm. where we have whole communities that uh, their stories are not heard, they're not valued properly, um, where they're oppressed for having a certain kind of faith or a certain color of skin or a certain kind of sexuality. And mm -hmm. in, you know, the deepest form of oppression in our world, I think, is when someone is treated as less than someone else. And the truth is we all bring the, uh, whether, whether we you know different spiritualities talk about this differently, we all bring the light of the divine into the world. And it's not like some of us yeah. have more of that yes. light than others. We all have the same degree of value, the same um, quality of light we bring into the world. And we need to see behind the masks that we wear to see the value of and goodness of each person. And, yes. and I don't think we can really heal anything until we understand that. Oh, I could not agree more. And that's part of, tell me about the last pillar. Hmm. And that's related to this. It's yeah. about uh, healing our beliefs, our mm -hmm. unconscious and our conscious beliefs, healing our false beliefs uh, so that we can wake up to the value and the dignity of what we and others bring into the world. And, you know, I think we all grow up in the world. Um, we pick up beliefs, some of which are true, some of which are false from our parents, from kids on the playground, from our teachers, from our partners, from peers, from the way we interpret different uh, experiences we have. Some of them are traumas, yeah. whether they are um, major traumas, shock traumas like child abuse or physical, emotional or sexual abuse, or just the drip, drip, drip of yeah. feeling like we're not good enough or being told we're not good enough in some way. I think there's something in the deeper self that doesn't rest until it experiences unconditional love, yeah. unconditional positive regard. And I think something in us is always scanning for that and we there's something in us that doesn't rest until we can find that ultimately we have to be able to give that gift to ourselves but we also need an environment um, where we 
limit the access of people to us who are um, overly judgmental or, yeah. or critical. Uh, there's something in us that does not do well with criticism and judgment. Yeah. Oh, I love this. And I love us kind of falling on this because that's really, again, in my clinic, it's science and testing and doing all this stuff. But yes. at the core, I realized this, and I'm sure you've seen this as well. If I create a space for someone to walk in and know they are loved and accepted, and I'll yeah. even tell them, I love you. Like it's that we were taught in medical school, never taught, you know, you know, first of all, don't share your own experience or share it. Like there's this barrier, right? But I feel like when I show up more authentically and give them permission to do the same, and then also just it's little things like giving them a wine glass filled with water when they walk in, like, wow, I must be like, it's just silly little things, but they feel like they're valued and that I really do care about them. And that I think yeah. is a container for healing that is. I don't know that I could scientifically prove it, but I know it's true. And I'm sure we'll have more and more evidence of creating a space for them to be heard, for them to know that nothing they yeah. can say is going to be judged by me. Like I can be open to anything and, and that they truly are by my staff and myself, like love that I think is the true, true secret yes. to helping healing. Yeah, I, I really believe that's true. And, and science is validating that more every day as it learns how to touch and test these deeper, more intangible dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. Science has come a long ways in that regard in the last 30 years. And so our science is getting better. Our mm -hmm. understanding of the importance of intuition is getting better. Uh, the cross-fertilization of different cultures is helping us realize that the Western left brain approach is not the only yeah. way to understand right. the world. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> There's more, yes. Oh, yeah. and, no, and, and, and well, and I'm sorry to interrupt. You know, I think it's, from my standpoint, one of the things that people often um, want to talk about um, when, when we talk about these things is that all of our institutions for thousands of years have been deficit-based. They're based on, on what's missing from us or there's something wrong right. with us and that we need some kind of external ex expert, whether in, um, in medicine, it's all about the disease and uh, we now know that the elimination of disease is not really where it's at. The person needs and deserves a level of well-being that's far beyond just getting rid of the disease. Right. So that's not just getting rid of, it's not just focusing on the disease. Psychology has historically been about childhood deficits instead of focusing on what's right and good about us. Psychiatry has been awful about reducing human problems of living to neurochemical defects. Yes. yes. And, and that's and just seen evidence just a few weeks ago about does serotonin deficiency really exist and the questioning of the science behind all of the, what we put on for SSRI. Right. <laughs> that's all, that the false idea, you know, yes. that whole yes. thing of a, a chemical imbalance that was thought up by um, pharmaceutical companies, but yes. it doesn't exist, you know? And, and so our human problems of living and suffering and trauma and healing are, Yes, it's, there's a place for medicines, but those only treat symptoms. If you want to heal, you need a new and truer experience of your value and your goodness. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, um, and so, but then religion for thousands of years has focused on things like original sin instead of original blessing, right. the fact that we're all created in the image of the divine. So, but I think our whole world is trying to groan in the direction of a more positive understanding of who we are and our value and liberate the individual from and communities from these deficit based beliefs. And so we're the we're in a very exciting time where there's a lot of fear about those new beliefs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But also there's you're right, the shift is happening. I mean, we're both it is happening. And there was so and the the science is following that and the fact that you could study this and yes. still even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was very hard to really talk about this and and remain, you know, respected in our field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um wow. That's this right. Is, oh yeah. Right? Yeah. I remember years ago, I mean, in medical yeah, school, you know, people thought I was crazy because I was always open to other things. And I, I was, again, still enmeshed in the traditional uh, allopathic training model, but I would always be open. And they, the, what happened was they thought I was crazy. But now 20 years later, when there's a problem, they'll call and say, um, Jill, this, we haven't been able to figure this out. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> so, right. Sure. Yeah, you were ahead of the yeah. pack. <laughs> and it's so important now. So what 20 years ago or 10 years ago looked crazy or a little right. bit. Right. You know, uh, is and now we know that that was on the path of what's really important. So yeah. it's it is. Thank you're you. right. So thank you for all your work. What would you say? Um, 
would be the biggest thing that with your, so you had a lot of people kind of coming to you first, you know, like, oh, I don't know if I want to go there with that study. And then eventually you um, enmeshed yourself and wrote this brilliant book. I love what you've written and want to share mm-hmm. it with everybody. But what would you say in this journey has been your biggest uh, shift in thinking or your biggest aha? And there's probably many, but if you had to pick just one, what was, what was the biggest turning point for you in all of this? Well, I think there's different ways to say this, but one one way of saying it is that in all of my training, um, and I think part of this is because I was trained in a Western way of thinking, both in medicine and also in theology, I was taught that the body is who we primarily are. And I don't believe that anymore. I believe that now we are basically these invisible selves or souls walking around and the body is an instrument for something we're trying to learn. And so, because when you see these amazing shifts where a person will have a new, truer experience of who they are, the body changes so quickly sometimes to catch up to that new understanding. I mean, these sometimes healings take 10 years, sometimes they take 10 months, and sometimes they take a really short amount of time. I mean, we're talking like a day or less or hours. And so it's shocking when you see some of this stuff and can document it. So I think when the deeper self or soul in us has a new and truer experience of our value and the dignity we bring into the world. And then I, I, there's a lot of implications for, for that because, because now when I'm ill or when I see people who are ill, I'm curious about what is the deeper self trying to say to them uh, through these symptoms? Um, is there a message that the body's, I mean, the body keeps the score. The body yes. tells the story. <laughs> right. oh, so my favorite. So I love when, let me just paraphrase. Cause I think I, I, I totally get what you're saying. It's almost like, cause I remember this was a cancer early on, even though it was confusing. I was in my twenties. I didn't know much. I remember yeah. thinking, there must be, in fact, for me, there was a, a scripture. This isn't for death, but for a greater purpose, basically, I'll uh, the paraphrase. And I remember hearing that and being like curious. And it's yeah. like getting curious. And then I realized, even though mm. I didn't know anything back then, I had this sense like, okay, yeah. this is here to teach me something. And I grabbed onto that like a raft boat for dear life. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I might die, but I'm going to try to learn something in the journey. But that is kind of what you're saying. And that truly in all of my illnesses and overcoming has been the, such the core. And even now, this morning, my refrigerator broke. My internet wasn't working. I wasn't sure all these things. But I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Am I not paying attention? Not that everything bad happens to teach us a lesson, but if we can always look for meaning and purpose and yeah. transformation in the journey, it makes it kind of a fun, exciting ride. <laughs> so I it love it. It really that. does. And yeah. it's also, yeah, I, I think that's well said. I think that there's also this, I think sometimes our illnesses are speaking to us about what we are afraid to see or understand. They speak to us out of the shadows of our lives. They yeah. speak to us out of what we're afraid to see. And and so that for me requires a very painful death sometimes. I have to die to old ways of believing and I have to be willing to surrender and let go of some of my beliefs so I can see something differently. And, and honestly, I resist doing that with every fiber of my being. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so there, there are things I do not want to see and I want to put them <laughs> in the shadows. I don't want to see the parts of my life where I've hurt people or where I need to make, make reparations or whatever it is, and every one of us both has the, I mean, I think uh, thing. I think good and evil cut through the hearts of every one of us. They're not outside of us, it's in us. And so we all, and I, I view evil as something where we make mistakes, you know, it's not something we often do consciously, but we can hurt others without realizing that. And so finding ways to begin seeing what we don't want to see or what's hard and painful to see and dealing with those which are often rooted in trauma, in my experience, yeah. um, and that's where liberation and healing and restoration can occur. And that's not a simple process. No, and so true. And then at the same time, the other things we were just talking about is that self-compassion. Like I literally learned years ago to kind of say, yes. oh, sweetheart, you know what? You might've messed up this time, but let's get up and try again. And like that compassion, because I didn't have that when I was growing yeah. up. But when I started to shift and know, oh, I messed up, I did something wrong, I want to make it right, or I want to shift my thinking, but also at the same time, having that compassion, which you just described so well. So, wow. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 You mentioned Gabriel Mate and, you know, he says, if you don't know how to say no, your body will eventually say no for you. Yes. (laughs) So, so true. This has been one of my favorite interviews. I am so grateful for your time and all the goodness you put into the world and all the even just self-searching and kind of trying to find truth because that's where it starts. Mm. So first of all, Mm. thank you from me and I'm sure from all the listeners. And then where can people find you? What's your website? Where, where can people find your book? Uh, tell us more about you. Mm. Yes, thank you. Uh, DrJeffreyRediger.com is my website. Uh, and Cured can be found in uh, local bookstores. It can be found on Amazon. Uh, it's in lots of languages at this point. Uh, it's confusing because it's got different subtitles, but it's the same text. It, it has it. lots of different book covers and lots of different subtitles because of the different translations, some of which are still English, but different sensibilities in the UK versus uh, <laughs> the states I've yeah. learned. So it's all different, but it's the same text. Awesome. So, so that's it. Well, we'll, we'll put links to your website. Thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it and all the work you're doing. You have an amazing journey yourself, it sounds like. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having me.